Welcome back to Conflicts of Interest. This is episode 295. I'm the host, Kyle Anzalone. On today's show, I'm covering the military's recruitment problem and the massive escalation being planned by Western leaders in the proxy war against Russia during Biden's trip to Europe. So be sure to share today's show as hosted at the Libertarian Institute. I repost the show on the blog at antiwar.com. I'm also the opinion editor at antiwar.com. And right now uh, at antiwar.com, we are hosting a fundraiser. So if you would like to support and make sure that high quality uh, journalism that isn't funded by the war state continues to exist, please head on over and support our fundraiser. You can follow uh, myself on Twitter at Kyle Anslone underscore. You can also follow the show at con underscore interest. Uh, the show is on anywhere you can listen to audio podcasts, but it's also on the Libertarian Institute all podcast feed along with the Scott Horton show. And you can support the show by doing your CBD shopping with our sponsor Paloma Verde. Paloma Verde CBD.com. The promo code is peace. P-E-A-C-E. And when you use that promo code, you're going to save 20% and the show is going to get a kickback. So it's a great way to help yourself get some high quality CBD products, but also keep the show going. Uh, in the past couple months, we've had a lot more people using that promo code and the shows uh, that that code is really helping the you know show to cover all of its costs and uh you know we're now able to look at improving equipment and everything like that so if you would like to help out the show and you want high quality cbd products you're either already a cbd user or you want to learn more about cbd they have a great education tab at paloma verde you can uh you know find contact there and get in touch with them and they will help you to find cbd products that are right for you uh, the other great thing about more people using that code is i've had more feedback from listeners on their experience with paloma verde and everybody tells me it's absolutely fantastic either for themselves or for their pets uh they have cbd dogs treats at Paloma Verde and I've gotten some really great feedback on that so again help out the show uh, help out the, yourself PalomaVerdeCBD.com just be sure to use the promo code piece when you check out all right let's get into the episode first article I have today I wrote uh, for the Libertarian Institute on June 27th Pentagon struggles to Recruit Young Americans Army Waves High School Graduation Requirement. A record low number of young Americans are eligible for military service and few are considering the military as a career. According to a report from NBC News, every branch of the Department of Defense is struggling to meet its 2020 to recruitment quotas. The military is rolling out new tactics to drive recruitment, including exploiting the new Top Gun movie, utilizing TikTok, and removing the requirement that soldiers uh, graduate high school. The Pentagon assesses that less than a quarter of young Americans meet the Pentagon standards for recruits, only 23% of citizens aged 17 to 24 are qualified to serve without a waiver, Army Chief of, Chief of Staff James McCauvel said before Congress, noting that number is declining. In recent years, 29% of 17 to 24-year-olds were eligible to serve. You know, he didn't get into the reasons that that number declined. It was apparently holding steady before, so I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if it was COVID lockdowns. Uh, you know, either be because of the increasing mental health issues that, you know, children are facing. And I haven't seen any data to say that American children are increasingly um, unhealthy physically be because, uh, you, you know, either COVID or the, the lockdowns, you know, more bees from less going outside less and interacting with other kids less or something like that. Wouldn't surprise me if that was the case. But, uh, uh, you know, you know they, they didn't get into that here. I just know that some people were interested in that um to uh continue uh nbc news obtained internal defense department survey that found only nine percent of qualified citizens want to join the military the lowest result since 2007 one causes young americans do not believe enlisting is in their long-term welfare over half the people pulled through through the they uh, thought they would have emotional or physical problems after leaving the military. And, you know, you know, this really isn't 
a surprise at all after the terror war that's gone on for the past 21 years that Americans would have this impression of the military because that is what a lot of people who are in the military say. Uh, in fact, I had a couple of vets retweet this article, uh, one telling kids to stay away from, from the military. The Army is well short of its recruitment goal, with just three months left in the 2022 fiscal year. The branch has only met 40% of its objective. The Army is waiving the requirement that soldiers graduate high school, and this is one of the efforts uh, they are undertaking to try to boost the number of recruits, is by expanding the pool by taking away a, a key requirement. The Army is also involuntary expanding the assignment of high-profile recruits. The Navy is focused on using the new Top Gun movie to influence young Americans to join. The first Top Gun movie was an effective tool to improve the image of the Navy and boost recruitment. There's been several really great articles written on this that uh, I recommend uh, people check out. I linked to one here in this article. Um, and then that that article is actually from uh, Task and Purpose uh, shows that sailors and airmen set up tables and theaters during the Memorial Day weekend to lure potential recruits. The Department of Defense is considering revising the ban on TikTok put in place by President Donald Trump. Trump thought that this was uh a security concern because uh, TikTok is a Chinese company. Uh, they hope that the site will pro uh, propel the numbers. Uh, this is what one defense official said. We had to be where the recruits are, and TikTok is one of the biggest social media platforms in the world. Now, there, there has been some pushback as the Pentagon has entered some of these domains uh, with, like, particularly Twitch, which is the gaming streaming service. They were doing some uh, recruiting on there and they received some pushback, including from Congresswoman AOC uh, was some of some of her best actions in Congress were around this issue. And so, you, you know, this can be repelled. And of course, if there aren't enough Americans who are willing to fight in these wars, I hope that this is going to cause Congress to really reconsider, uh, you know, America's military roles if there are no Americans willing to fight. A couple more stories on the Pentagon before I move on to talk about the war in Ukraine. Sanders bring Biden's 2023 military budget request to 857 billion. This from Dave DeCamp at antiwar.com on June 16th. The Senate Armed Services Committee on Thursday released its version of the 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, that would authorize 857.6 billion in military spending for the 2023 fiscal year, a massive increase over the 813 billion President Biden requested. Out of the 856 billion, about 817.3 billion will go to the Pentagon. 29.7 billion will go to the Energy Department's nuclear weapons program, and 10.6 billion is allocated for military-related spending outside of the NDAA. The committee, which has 13 Republicans and 13 Democrats, approved the massive spending bill in a vote of 23 to 3. The ink Increase from what Biden requested was expected as lawmakers wanted to ta tack on a three to five percent increase over inflation. Biden's initial eight point or eight hundred and thirteen billion dollar request was a four percent increase over what was authorized in twenty twenty two. And so th this is how it's progressing. My guess is it may get a little bit bigger, uh, but I think we are coming closer to the end of the process on the this ADA, NDAA, the Pentagon funding bill. And so uh, th this may be closer to the final number that we're going to get around $860 billion. Uh, we also have news that Lockheed Martin has received a $2.3 billion contract to provide the Pentagon with 120 Black Hawk helicopters. Uh, the Pentagon has offered a contract for testing high-powered microwaves as anti-drone weapons, and SpaceX is contracting with the military. This is Elon Musk's company, and I think this is a very important note as 
you know, Musk considers buying Twitter. I think we're going to see some of the same conflicts of interest uh, we see with Bezos and the New York Times. All right, next article, uh, and this is the second article I wrote yesterday for the Libertarian Institute. Ukrainian special operations forces claim to have carried out operations inside of Russia. And this is a report from the Times uh, of London. The Times spoke with an intelligence officer and two sergeants in the Ukrainian special forces elite Shamit battalion who claimed Kiev had carried out uh, several covert operations inside of Russia. The officials said they successfully carried out raids involving explosions to sow confusion and dissent among Russians. One of the special operations officers explained the mission involved sabotage and explosives. And this is what he said. The most interesting mission missions are working behind enemy lines planting explosives behind the front lines beyond the border he said the second sergeant indicated the shaman battalion's ray behind enemy lines was successful he claimed the russians didn't know what happened they often can't believe we were there the officer gave few details about their operations to the times although he did say on one operation uh, a tire blew out they detailed using helicopters flying at low altitude uh, but nothing enough to identify that they had carried out a specific operation at least not what the times revealed publicly and so you know to to you know put an asterisk here for people who said that you know this sounds unlikely you know, I, I do agree to some extent that there, there is some unlikeliness to this. However, there have been several explosions reported in Russia since Vladimir Putin's uh, ordered the invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. And while Kiev has not officially taken responsibility for any of the attacks inside Russia, it has hinted that it might be responsible for some of the explosions. And so, again, there's not conclusive evidence that these people are telling the truth. There is also an intelligence intelligence official, a Ukrainian intelligence official who confirmed this story. So you have, I, I would say, two and a half sources. You have two members who seem to have spoken with the Times together. And then you have the the second source, the second true source, uh, also coming from the Ukrainian government. Uh, but even if this is just an official admission from the Ukrainian government that this is happening, uh, is nonetheless very uh, important that, you know, we have from Ukraine that them saying that this is the case is likely to provoke some kind of reaction from Russia. And this is is a, an important point that I didn't make on the uh, CIA story uh, when I when I was discussing that on the last show. This is that the the uh, U.S. has CIA officers in Kiev at the very least, passing a significant amount of intelligence to the Ukrainian government. But Dave DeCamp, uh, who is my coworker at AntiWar.com and the the great director of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, Daniel McAdams, both made this point that look, you, you know, when you take something that even if like if, if this is happening, you know, these attacks happened last month or something like that. Russia knows that they happened, right? You know, Putin has gotten that intelligence. Maybe that doesn't make this that big of a deal. However, when it becomes public, there may be a humiliation factor that Russia then has to account for looking tough or, or something like that. So I, I, I don't necessarily worry that this isn't going to provoke some kind of reaction from Russia, this kind of story becoming public. Uh, my article continues. During the war in Afghanistan, the Shaman Battalion fought with the U.S. and U.K. Special Forces. A senior Ukrainian official said, We send the sh them, the Shaman Battalion, to take on the most difficult task because they are the best and the bravest. They are hugely important to the war effort. And then, you know, also noted in the Times article by these uh, sergeants is that they've been fighting, you know, a as a part of this Special Forces group since the war broke out in 2014. And so not only is this an admission that, you know, this really is an eight year long war that's been going on. And while the Russian invasion was a significant escalation in that, you know, for these people, they have been fighting a war for eight years, not four months. 
some to understand when you just how well that you know these brigades operate and how their their attitude towards war uh yeah at one point in here they they talk very coldly about killing uh with the times as how the times describes it uh one of the the sergeants says that the, the best place to shoot people, uh, men, is in the groin because there's not enough body armor there and describes killing a man that way. So, uh, the, you know, this is kind of the attitude of the two uh, unnamed. They, they have photographs of them, uh, you know, in their gear with their faces blurred. And then I think they have identified them. One is 22 and I forget the name of the other one. Huntsman, Huntman in, the, in, in this story, but those are obviously just you know, monikers given, um, uh, bet, bet to, uh, just wrap up the article. The sergeants explained their units have been deployed to several battles inside of Ukraine. However, they say their forces supplies are diminishing as the fight in the Eastern, in Eastern Ukraine's Donbass region raids on one of the officers told the time that half their friends had died in recent weeks. An intelligence officer confirmed that Ukrainian soldiers casualties are on the rise. Ukraine's casualties rate far lower than Russia's in the initial weeks of this war, is now approaching parity with the invading forces, he said. All right, so Biden is in Europe right now, and he, I think, is still in Germany for the G7 as I speak here on June 28th, and then the NATO conference in Spain is set to begin on May, on May, um, June 29th. And so we have, you know, a day till we get to the NATO summit. But some of what I'm talking about here is announcements that are going to be made official at the NATO summit. Some of it is announcements that were made at the G7. Uh, I guess the NATO summit is probably going to invite more leaders than uh, the G7 summit. But uh, there's a lot of overlapping participants in the these two events. So the first article I have is from Dave DeCamp, June 27th at Antiwar.com, titled U.S. Preparing to Buy Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems for Ukraine. U.S. officials said the Biden administration is preparing to purchase Norwegian Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, and NAMAMS is the acronym, for Ukraine as part of the new weapons package it will likely announce this week. The air defense systems is an advanced uh, system with a range of over 100 miles and is used to project protect airspace around the White House and the Capitol building in Washington. The system is a joint project between the Norway-based defense and aerospace and Raytheon and the U.S. arms, uh, which is uh, the U.S. arms maker that formerly employed Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin. National Security Advisor Jade Sullivan told reporters the administration plans to finalize the package this week and will give Ukraine the advanced air defense capabilities and other weapons without specifying the type of systems. We do intend to finalize that package, uh, the, a package that includes advanced medium and long-range air defense capabilities for Ukrainians, along with some other systems that are of urgent need, including ammunition for artillery and and counter-battery radar system, Sullivan said. The fact that the U.S. is planning to purchase the uh, air, uh, Norwegian air defense system suggests that the administration will use funds from the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, which gives the president the authority to purchase arms for Ukraine. The $40 billion Ukraine aid bill President Biden recently signs into law includes $6 billion for that fund. Another major escalation is NATO looks to increase the number of troops that it has deployed in Europe. This from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com on June 27th. NATO to increase high readiness force over to over 300,000 troops. NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg announced Monday that the alliance will increase its high readiness force from 40,000 troops to over 300,000 as a part of a plan he called the biggest overhaul of our collected defense and deterrence since the Cold War. The NATO response force was formed in 2003 and was first activated in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The entire force wasn't developed, but several thousand troops 
from the U.S. and other NATO countries were sent to Eastern Europe as a part of the response force. The U.S. currently has over 100,000 troops stationed in Europe for the first time since 2005 as a result of NATO boosting its forces on what it calls its eastern flank. Stoltenberg outlined plans to make the reinforced uh, reinforcement more permanent that will officially uh, be officially announced during the upcoming NATO summit in Madrid. Uh, a lot of these, uh, I know Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, the Baltic states would definitely want more uh, permanent deployments of troops and, and have been advocating and angling for that. Uh, Spain is also planning to use its form at the Madrid summit uh, to rally, I, I guess, NATO to help out with their migration problem. I'm not sure if that necessarily means more forces. It could, or, or more intelligence sharing, uh, looking to get more, you know, intelligence to intercept migrants before they get uh, to Spain. That way, uh, Spain doesn't have to deal with them. Now, Russia is responding to some of the provo uh, provocations going on by the West. Putin says Russia will send nuclear-capable Icelander missiles to Belarus on Saturday. Russian President Vladimir Putin said Moscow will provide Belarus with nuclear-capable missiles in coming months after Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko expressed concern over NATO flights near Belarusian territory. In the coming months, we will transfer Belarus Icelander M tactical missile systems, which can uh, use ballistic or cruise missiles in their conventional and nuclear version, Putin said in a meeting with Lukashenko. At the meeting, Lukashenko asked if Russia could help Belarus to upgrade its fighter jets so that they are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. We are very concerned about the training flights by the U.S. and NATO airplanes, which practice carrying nuclear warheads and nuclear weapons, Lukashenko said. Therefore, I ask for your consideration. Uh, consider an equivalent response to these actions without overdoing it. Putin pledged Russia would help Belarus uh, S-25 planes re-equipped to carry nuclear warheads. And so as we're seeing, these Western countries increase their support not only for Ukraine, but their overall anti-Russia position. We see uh, Russia responding in kind. Uh, I also want to note on the deployment of U.S. forces that Biden says he is extending the, the deployment of forces that are uh, have been deployed to Poland. I think they've been there for about six months now, and so he has to go ahead and extend that deployment for an additional period of time. And that was reported by NBC News. The G7 pledges to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. This from Dave DeCamp at Antiwar.com, uh, published yesterday. The leaders of the G7 nations pledged open-ended support for Ukraine after the second day of a three-day summit in Germany. In a statement, the leaders of U.S., Britain, France, Germany, Japan, Italy, and Canada said they would provide Ukraine with military, economic, and humanitarian assistance for as long as it takes. The White House released a fact sheet announcing a plan to implement new sanctions on Russia in coordination with the G7 nations. According to the plan, the U.S. will implement higher tariffs on more than 570 groups of Russian products, That a move that comes as America is facing soaring inflation and gas prices. The U.S. will also ban the import of Russian gold, which President Joe Biden announced on Sunday, tougher together. The G7 will announce that we will ban the import of Russian gold, a major export that rates in tens of billions of dollars for Russia, Biden wrote on Twitter. And so we also have uh, Biden making mention of uh, this plan that was proposed by Janet Yellen for a price cap on Russian oil. Now, I'm not 100% sure on how this would work. And so, you know, I, I'm just, you know, reporting some early details, and this is what was written in the New York Times. A price cap would allow Russia to keep selling its oil abroad, but sharply, sharply limit its re revenue. It was the brainchild of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who has told world leaders in recent weeks that such a 
uh, cap would be the best way to reduce oil prices and avert a global recession. And it seems that they're going to agree that they're only going to pay Ed's price per bail barrel for Russian oil. I don't know what happens if Russia raises above that price, if they're going to like take the oil and then send Russia a lower amount and how that's going to play in the long run. Now, this was written in the New York Times, and I just thought it was worth noting. Allied leaders had hoped that economic sanctions would damage the Russian economy so severely and quickly Mr. Putin would face economic and political pressure to cut the war short. Instead, oil re- Russian oil revenue remains high. Internal opposition has been muzzled. As Putin gloats, it is the West that has suffered high fuel prices and risked domestic political backlash. And again, that, you know, this is the New York Times writing that I, I think is fairly significant and important to point out. So this is uh, another very important story, and this is escalation on the Russian side again. Uh, This is Dmitry Medvedev, who is a Putin ally and former president of Russia. He says, any encroachment on the Crimean Peninsula by a NATO member state could amount to a declaration of war on Russia, which would lead to World War III. Now, I feel that throughout this conflict, uh, Medvedev has been marginally more hawkish than Putin and seems to be more hawkish than the Russian policy actually is. Now, that doesn't mean that he is stating the Russian policy. I, I think he kind of is actually stating that the Russian policy here, but you know, just worth knowing that this guy is more of a hawk. Uh, that being said, he is a Putin ally. He said, for us, Crimea is a part of Russia, and that means forever. Any attempt to encroach on Crimea is a declaration of war against our country. And this statement is very important to understand because you have Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, saying, if you give me the right Western weapons, I will be able to take back the Crimean Peninsula. And so this, uh, you know, is a pretty significant, you know, red line that Russia is drawing here that Zelensky has already pledged to violate. And so the U.S. should really consider what that means to give uh, Ukraine the, the weapons in that case. An influential senator, uh, Senator Rich, uh, visited Ukraine, and he is, I think, the ranking member of, uh, he is the top Republican, so the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which is a pretty substantial uh, role to be in. And he said, uh, while visiting Zelensky in Kiev, I will continue to do everything in my power to ensure the Biden administration uses the authorities Congress has given to provide President Zelensky and Ukrainian defense forces exactly what they need to end this conflict. Ukraine must win this fight. And, you know, this kind of reminds me, this statement reminds me of one of the problems pointed out in a recent Washington Post article, and that is while, you know, the U.S. is pledging all this additional aid to Ukraine, to Zelensky, he isn't looking now to reestablish the status quo prior to the Russian invasion, but to retake territory like the Crimean Peninsula. And so Rish going to Ukraine and making these statements is quite provocative. Now, this it was announced that Rich was in Ukraine on Sunday, but that doesn't mean he was in Ukraine on Sunday. So it's unclear if he was in uh, Kiev during the missile strikes that occurred uh, on Sunday. Russia hit several targets around Ukraine, uh, noting that there was a uh, shopping mall that that is being you know this story is blowing up apparently 12 people were killed uh, by a Russian attack in, in Ukraine on a shopping mall uh, Russian denies uh, I, I think at this point hitting the target they're not saying that no it wasn't a shopping mall it was being used for weapons or something like that uh, the Russian claim here is saying that no we didn't fire it it's a hundred percent possible that uh, another actor uh, presumably Ukraine but or even maybe a miscommunication with uh, either the Donbass forces or the Luhansk forces uh, that wasn't Russia that 
actually hit this target. Uh, but, you know, it being the Ukrainians is, is a possibility as well that, that they fired and hit it. Uh, if there is an investigation here, it's possible that we will find debris from the missile uh, that will indicate what side fired it. Um, that being said, you know, there, there is, I think, some conflicting information that doesn't quite make sense at this point. So I'm a little bit skeptical of all the narratives around this story. Uh, Ukraine is saying that there were a thousand people in the shopping mall, but only 12 people were killed. Now, that could mean it hit a courtyard that was empty or it hit some store that had gone out of business or that was closed for whatever reason. And, you know, the rest of the mall was relatively unharmed. And that's why the death count is so low, 100 percent possible. But uh, the, the death count being so low and saying that the mall was so crowded definitely raises some suspicion, especially when it looks like a, a significant portion of the mall was damaged uh, by some of the pictures that have been shown. Let's see. I believe that. Oh, I, I also want to note here that Putin says he will be going to the G upcoming G20 summit. And this is going to create an interesting political situation and possibly create a situation where Vladimir Putin is at the same place as some other Western leaders, uh, potentially setting the opportunity uh, for a talk to happen. I don't think that's likely, uh, but I just wanted to. To mention that. All right. Oh, uh, this is, you know, kind of really breaking as far as the show goes, but apparently uh, Turkey has made an agreement with Sweden and Finland to allow those two countries to join NATO. I, uh, I, I guess I don't want to comment too much on it yet just because it... You know, this I, I read the first kind of drafts of this story coming out uh, before I recorded, but I do want to note that that seems to be occurring. And uh, I, I'm not that surprised. I had speculated on the last episode of the show that Erdogan meeting with the Turkish, or with the Erdogan is the president of Turkey, meeting with the leaders of Finland and Sweden uh, right before the conference suggested that maybe they were going to make a big announcement at the conference. And that does now seem to be the case. All right, last story generally involving this uh, Russia issue is France wants sanctions eased to get Iranian Venezuelan oil back on the market. France wants to explore lifting the sanctions of oil-producing nations, Venezuela and Iran, to ease global energy prices, uh, a French presidency official told Reuters on Monday. There are resources elsewhere that need to be explored, the official, speaking on condition of anonymity, uh, said in the sidelines of the G7 summit in Germany. The U.S. and Iran are returning to indirect negotiations that will now be held in Doha, Qatar, instead of Vienna. The negotiations stalled over the U.S. refusal to lift the terror designation of the Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, but Tehran has now dropped its demand to have that designation lifted. So there is a knot that needs to be untied if applicable. To get Iran Iranian oil back on the market, the French president said, we have Venezuelan oil that also needs to come back on the market. Now, I also want to note here that uh, Iran is continuing to export uh, they're diluting agents and other fuel to Venezuela in order to help the Venezuelan economy and to help the Venezuelan government produce more oil. And then also that there was apparently a high ranking, uh, U S envoy in Venezuela. I believe it was the hostage envoy in Venezuela, just, uh, this past week. And so that would suggest that there are continuing uh, negotiations going on between the U S and Venezuela. And, and this could be a good sign. Now also want to mention here that uh, French president Emmanuel Macron uh, apparently spoke with the UAE and Saudi Arabia and said, those two countries can barely increase their oil output. And so we need to look at other options like Venezuela and uh, Iran. Want to talk about Iran and what, or, or excuse me, Iraq and what's happening there, real quick. This from Jason Ditz at antiwar.com. Iraq swears in new members of parliament to replace Sadr resignations. And so the last time I talked about Iraq on the show, I was saying that the Sadrist bloc, uh, 73 members of Iraq's parliament, were planning to resign. Uh, 
These people follow uh, cleric Motada al Sadr, who has a lot of influence in Iraq, uh, but it's very hard to understand what he's doing politically. And at times, and I've heard this from analysis as well, it, it doesn't always seem like he really understands political strategy that well and doesn't always make uh, the, the best moves. And so he had his uh, block resign. Iran had been, or Iraq, excuse me, had been in p- political deadlock for months and months and months. Uh, there was contestion over the election. And then once it was finally decided and all the lawsuits were cleared up, nobody could form a government. And so now, uh, with the, the satirist out, there are uh, members of parliament replacing them. And apparently, uh, according to Jason Ditz, the seats mostly went to the Shia Cor- uh, coordination framework, which are the people who came in second in in the previous election, and they now have 122 uh, members of parliament, and that's a plurality in the Iraqi parliament, and so that's a potential uh, path to governance, and. Don't know if this was intentional on on Sadr's behalf, if he thought this would happen, uh, but the political instability in Iraq is very important, and we're we're going to see that with the next story that I talk about. But you know, I I don't know exactly how this is going to unfold in Iraq. I do think that these are very important developments, and it's going to definitely uh, influence and shape the Iraqi government of the future. Now, I want to talk about wh- what Iraq's role in the Middle East is, and the Iraqi Prime Minister just traveled to Saudi Arabia on Saturday, and then Iraq on uh, Iran on Sunday, uh, meeting with high-ranking officials, I believe actually Raisi, the, the leader of Iran, the, the political leader of Iran um, on Sunday. In Iran, uh, they discussed resuming Tehran Riyadh talks, and Raisi said dialogue can help resolve regional issues. And so not very specific, but does seem to be an endorsement uh, from you know what people say is the hardline Iranian leader in engaging in talks with Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran had engaged in five rounds in talks in earlier in the year, but they were suspended in April after Saudi Arabia carried out a mass execution of 81 people, including 41 Shia. A lot of the people executed in Saudi Arabia are not anything like pedophile, or pedophiles, murderers, rapists, or anything. They're, they're people who protest against the government. And so uh, Iran broke off talks, but they say, you know, that they're now ready to resume talks. Now, the other thing going on uh, that I think is worth noting is it seems that uh, Tehran and Riyadh are most incentivized to engage in talks anytime there's progress in talks between Tehran and Washington. And so now that the JCPOA is back on the table, uh, talks are back going there. Now, Saudi Arabia, I think, is probably more interested in talking with Iran and potentially why we're seeing some progress. All right, now wrapping up on Yemen, got to tell everybody, the Libertarian Party, this is why I joined the party. This is why I went to Reno. This is why I wanted Angela McArdle to be the party chair. Uh, The Libertarian Party is carrying out a week of action on the Yemen war. They are saying our action plan against the starvation blockade in Yemen isn't over, and we need your help to continue to be relentless against it. Uh, They want, you know, people to retweet, and they're saying call one eight three three stop war pretty easy to remember to tell your representative to co-sponsor hj res 87 the new power war powers resolution and look we could argue and debate whether or not that this will actually uh, legally kill uh, the war in Yemen, but we have seen time and time again the more political pressure there is on the White House, and one of the ways to put political re- pressure on the White House is by passing, by adding co-sponsors to these resolutions, and every single time it's, uh, it's caused the White House to scale back its support for the war in Yemen. And so, you know, right now we've had a several month-long ceasefire in Yemen, and this is 
fantastic and really important. However, that doesn't mean the war is over. The starvation blockade is still on. The World Food Program reports that they've had major funding shortages, and this has resulted in aid cuts again for people in Yemen. The World Food Program is feeding 13 million people in Yemen. Five people, uh, five million of those are now reduced to 50% of the daily uh, food rations and 8 million, so most of them are reduced to 25% of the daily food rations. And so people are barely getting by. Everybody has been cut to the absolute minimum of what they could eat and still survive. And so it's very important that we take this action, that we repeal all U.S. support for this war. That way this starvation campaign could end. I'm so happy the Libertarian Party is uh, putting this effort for first and foremost. Uh, you know, we had the new the new board takeover and this is essentially the first thing that they're doing is a real indication of the dredge and the libertarian party and why uh you know at this point i'm on board with this so i'm really excited this is really important and uh you know if you haven't yet please go ahead and make that call all right everybody just uh wrap up here Follow me on Twitter at Kyle Anzalone underscore again, libertarian institute or uh, antiwar.com. Uh, really the most important site for producing anti-war journalism, uh, you know, laying out nothing funded by the war state, nothing funded by the military industrial complex and explaining, you know, how people are stealing our money, getting rich off of it and killing people uh, as the excuse for spending and laundering that money. Uh, there, there's nowhere better than antiwar.com so if you can please support over there and i will be back with another episode later in the week